keep it nice and informal, so I'm just going to kind of chat with you guys through this. Uh, any questions, you know, bring them up and we'll talk about it. I'm going to skip a lot of the videos and stuff like that because normally we, we do, um, especially if they're not pertinent to, to anyone here, except the jackass from the crossroad. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Oh, you want to turn that off? Yeah, it's up well, to you. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Get that one, too. Yeah, there you go. I like the, the uh, ad on TV where there's this guy walk, walks across the road, he's parenting. <coughs> yep. And there's two deer sitting in your car. Right. Watching them and shaking their heads. Yeah. <laughs> i got to show you this one. This is just an icebreaker. It's me getting tased at our cat. <laughs> Carry a taser, you gotta get tased. They tase you in the back. Alright. Five seconds of that suck, I'm telling you. Um, so, this is what we're gonna be talking about today. So, we'll just roll through this here. Pre trips, you guys know you have to do them, right? Sign them, date them. And then the second bullet there says you gotta have it with you. Because when we do random inspections, that's what we're going to be asking for, your driver's license, and then your pre-trip inspection. And then we're going to take a quick look through your bus and see if you see any obvious stuff that you are pencil whipping through or not catching on your pre-trip, right? And this is why we do this, because this is a lot of the stuff that we see out there. Probably missing, lights missing. Look at that tire. Over half the tread missing. Air tanks that are clamming around, you know, that's going to make some noise when you're going over bumps. So we, we're not asking you to fix it, we're simply asking you to report it so the mechanic can fix it, right? But that's why we have you do pre-trips, pretty important. <clears throat> Stuff like this we expect you to catch on your pre-trip. If, if you're just walking around the vehicle, you're not going to catch it, but if you're doing a pre-trip correctly, you will. Right? Stuff like this. Look underneath your bus once in a while. Okay. Again, we're not asking you to identify what the problem is. You just bring it in and say, "Hey, it's something leaking in the, in the interior wheel." All right. If you cross railroad tracks, okay, um, and we see you that you duct tape your window shut. All right. We probably have an issue there. Okay. <laughs> we see something like this. <coughs> okay, that's uh, that's bad, right? Because you know your fattest little kid's gonna be back there jumping on that one day and go gonna go through, and they're too dumb to realize that there's two big wheels going around the road right there, right? So, how bus drivers, how are we gonna catch that? I mean, how do we know if there's a hole or that looks like it's been welded up before, right? So how do we know that there's a hole there without going and jumping on? Well, you can use this for noise. Dust, yeah. dust, dust. Yeah, exactly. Like You're going to see the dust, the, the wetness, the snow come through. So when you go back and you open up your emergency door and you look on the floor from back to front and you see a dusty area, a wet area, all right, that's a telltale sign that you got a hole in the floor of your bus or a hole somewhere. So that stuff needs to be reported. Okay, then they can come in there and find that and fix that. So make sure you look for that stuff. If your seats, posts look like that, that's got to be replaced, okay? When we buckle in kids, we ask you to follow the recommendations here, just like the state statute tells you to. This, whatever they got going on here, is not, not oh, correct, okay? okay. Um, that's, that's bad, 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 okay? We just don't do stuff like that. If you don't know what you're doing and you don't have the right car seat for the bus, then you got to tell your transportation director, all right? Do we have anyone in here that deals with this? Yep. Yep. Okay. So we'll go through these. Okay, these are um, passengers in different restraints, 30 mile an hour in front end crashes, and it kind of tells, kind of shows what's going to happen if you're not doing your job properly by strapping those kids in. Okay, this is the occupant position belt. In other words, just because you see straps across their chest doesn't mean they're actually belted in. It just means it's holding them up in the chair like it's designed to do. Yeah. As you can see, there's no holding power there, okay? So if you're subbing and you need to do that, for instance, don't just assume that that's got any restraint to it. 
Um, <coughs> if uh, a driver does a pre-trip on a bus in the morning, drives it out on a road, and then someone else uses that bus for an extracurricular trip in the afternoon, is that driver required to do a pre-trip inspection? No. But they've got to have the pre-trip signed up off by the person who did it. But what if the driver in the morning that drove it in pre-trip missed some of those things you just showed? Who is responsible? The driver would do the pre-trip. So you got to have their pre-trip with you that's signed by them and dated that day. And if they missed it, it's on them. It's on them, not yeah. on the driver that drives for the extra trip. Right. One, pre always, one pre trip per bus per day, and it's on the person who signed it. I always like to do a, a pre trip anyway because yeah, most people want to know that everything is good to go just in yeah. case something was missed or something happened during that route that it was driven. Exactly. So here's a lap belt. This is what we don't want just lap belts on school buses. <laughs> I can tell you that the federal government is looking at putting school buses on every, or seat belts on every bus in 2017 and beyond, which is going to cost about an extra ten to $12,000 per bus when you buy them. Um, where that money is going to come from, that's a big, big mystery yet. But we ask them to not say lap belts. That's why. Because that's, kids are going to break their necks. Right. You, ask, you ask them to what? To not just say lap belts. Oh, if oh. they're going to mandate seatbelts, it's got to be a shoulder strap and a lap belt. Mm. Um, because if you just put a lap belt, that's what's going to happen. That's going to break your necks. Okay. Yeah. Is it better than nothing on, let's say, a, a, a T-bone or a rollover? Absolutely. Um, but you think about that on the front end crash, that's pretty dangerous. Because those kids don't wear them left belts properly anyhow. They're going to wear them loose. They're going to slide forward in the seat. Their hips are going to get caught at some point. They're going to go like this and the next thing you get snapped. Versus them sliding into the back of that seat. And that's what compartmentalization was designed to do. The problem is compartmentalization was designed back in the 1970s. The seats were lower. Remember back then they used to actually have the bare bars showing and stuff like that. So things are getting better. They're actually raising the seats backs, right? Which is a problem for you guys because you can't see them anymore. Yeah. Well, compartmentalization works well if it's a front end crash and that's it. You do a front end crash and how many crashes do we see or do a front end crash and come to stop? Very few of any. It's bam, bam, then there's a second crash, right? The secondary crash or the secondary rollover, or I'm avoiding that first crash, so I hit the ditch and now I've rolled over or I've hit a tree. And usually it's not straight on, because the driver usually does a good job at avoiding the first thing, you know? So compartmentalization doesn't work at all when the bus rolls or tips or gets T-boned. Kids get thrown everywhere. I've seen some videos that uh, have been done on school bus studies of kids in different positions, even in the car compartmentalization of seats, and it's awful, unless it's a front end crash. Uh, <clears throat> so, and that, that, those videos really changed my mind about seatbelts. Before I said, we're, we're dead set against, I'm dead set against any seatbelt on the school bus mm -hmm. because of car compartmentalization. Now I say, yeah, I understand that. Uh, so people always talk about, well, seatbelts. Um, what happens when the bus is on fire? What happens when I crash and I roll into a lake? Okay? Um, it's no different than if you didn't have seatbelts. The driver, number one, is seatbelted in, right? So hopefully they can get out of their seatbelt and go help the kids out and get out of their seatbelts. Kids learn fast. Kids will learn how to get in and get out of the seatbelt. We teach some kids in our private vehicles, do we not? Mm -hmm. My six year old knows how to get in and out of her seatbelt very good. Um, so they will learn that in a school bus. So if you roll over into a lake, would you rather have the kids conscious and able to get themselves out possibly or unconscious, right? Because they've all piled onto the roof and they're all on top of each other with broken bones and stuff. The obvious answer is we want them in that seat where it's the safest place to be so they can be as conscious as possible to help get out themselves get out and help others get out especially the other kids and the, and the bus driver. 
How do we deal with the kids that won't put the seatbelts on? Train. It's just like a kid who won't stay seated. Mm -hmm. You keep writing them up, and eventually that goes to the school or the, or the transportation director, and they take a week off. And if they do it again, they take two weeks off. You know, I mean, it's training. It really is. Kids are trainable, and I'm not saying every kid, but the majority of kids will do what's right. And and peer pressure. Two, two or three that you got to be training and training and training. Then they need to come sit right behind you and just right in front. Or they need to take a week off the bus. It's as simple as that. As far as the bus flipped over on its top and seatbelts, they all they all release, don't they, even if there's weight hanging on the seatbelts? Oh yeah, just like any other seatbelt, so it's a button. Push a button and they should fall out of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we, when you say, when people are against seatbelts, that's part of the reason. We don't want lap belts. Lap belts are bad, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Better than nothing if they're worn properly, but in the front end crash, we don't want them. Okay, um, look. In the magazines, we've been seeing some of those various forms of seatbelts. What are they, from the highway patrol department, what are they thinking? The three point? Yeah. Over both shoulders? Well, I maybe for the younger kids, they're talking about that. And there's, there's several different designs out there, but there's some seats in the seat backs that actually fold down into some type of a booster seat that actually have the bike. And then you can fold those up and it still would be here. still would be used for the lap and shoulder. So some of the things we're gonna be looking for obviously that you should be looking for are these here, the corrosiveness, sorry, if they lose their power, the cracks. If your seat belts, when you pull them out, you make sure they pull out when they're supposed to and they retract when they're supposed to and they lock when they're supposed to. But when you pull them out and it looks like that, that's got to be replaced. Okay, that's lost its strength. There's my buddy Chad Doppenbach. He covers all of southern Minnesota. Um, when you pull these pull these over or put them over, you're looking for the four screws in them. Okay? They have to be stowed when they're not used. Now, if you use them every day, five days a week, morning and night, that's fine. Leave them out. You know, it's common sense. You use them twice a week, then the rest of the days they need to be out of the floor, up and stored in a bag, mm -hmm. right? And that's according to the statute, retract or remove or otherwise stored uh, when not used to prevent tripping of persons and damage to vehicles. In other words, they can't be just laying on the floor so people trip over and stuff like that. That's the rule 7450. In the interest of time, I want to make sure everybody can get out when they need to you want questions at the end? Or no, just ask as we go. I, how long will it be about? Do you think so? They well, we're going to bust. I'm, I'm a little over an hour at that. We're going we're busting through this. Okay, time, good, so. good. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Before you go, if you have any questions, just stop and ask and around. Okay. And we are going to blow through a lot of these things pretty fast. So the flat mirrors, okay. People are missing a lot of this question on the test when they go research on the school bus up. 200 feet to the rear, that's what you need to be able to see. They're convex mirrors, right? 32 feet to the rear, 12 feet up from the side. Look what really pops out of it in the convex. You've got to be able to see your, your rear dualies, okay? Mm -hmm. um, your crossover mirror, very important. But look at this area right here. Where is that? It's right here. It's by your driver's side. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to see that, right? And remember when, when we talk about mirrors, we want to look and see what we're looking at. There's a difference, right? We can look and not see, okay? Um, and if you've heard this before, you've heard me probably talk about why I, I have a little bit of passion for safety. This mirror right here could have saved the 11, six, six year old boy in Pine, Pine River. You guys hear about that crash? Probably not up here, but several years back, um, 74 year old bus driver stops, drops one kid off and one kid dies. He gets his head run over by the rear dualies. Why? 74 year olds dealing with issues in his bus, two students not getting along. So while Evan gets out and goes to his house, it's after school, bus driver turns around and deals with these two people in the back and their special needs kids. Turns around, doesn't see Evan, looks in his mirror su supposedly. Um, he's supposedly scanned his crossover mirrors. Um, he looked to the left, wide open front yard, blue house, white door. That's where Evan lives. He didn't see Evan. He just assumed Evan had already made it into his house. Well, he was wrong. He pulls out and runs Evan's head over with the rear dually to the bus. Uh, that's a bad 
day, right? It's a bad day for law enforcement. It's an awful day for a bus driver, and it's a really horseshit day for a mom and dad. Okay, so I happen to be the responding trooper that day. Uh, one of two of us that went down there and dealt with that. Kind of a kind of a earth shattering or world shattering event. You know, putting a six year old kid dead body in a body bag sucks. Um, especially when it can be 100% avoidable, right? No reason for that. One kid got off the bus, one kid died. That's crazy. That's stupid, right? Um, which, a couple points here. When you've got kids coming on and off the bus, the only thing that matters in your world at that time is those kids. That's it. World War III can be going on behind you in the bus. Let it go on. There are seven kids that have died in the last five years in Minnesota. Have they died inside the bus or have they died outside and around the bus? Outside and around the bus. That is our danger. Your, your kids can create holy havoc in the back and they'll be okay. Until, until you get everything secured, you see the kids walking and they're safe, then you pull over and you can go deal with little devils in the back, right? When kids are getting on and off the bus, your attention has to be those kids, period. And we count our kids, the second one, right? We've got three kids getting on or off. We count them on the county road or we count them getting off my bus. I see one walking down the driveway and two walking down the county road and they're well off the road. I've got three kids. I'm good to go. Let's go, right? Perfect. Problem is, if you ever lose count or you think you you see one kid there and one kid there, you're like, hey, where did the other one go? Oh, man, maybe I just miscounted. BS, right? Your only answer there, if you miss count or you're not quite sure where you, another kid is at, and for neutral parking brake on, get outside that bus, right? Because kids are stupid, right? Kids will end up on the bus for some really dumb reason. And I've got a nine year old kid and a six year old daughter, a nine year old boy, six year old daughter, and my nine year old boy is stupid, right? And most kids are dumb, they do not realize how much a bus weighs and they don't realize the danger of a bus. But they've all been trained to like the bus. Here comes the happy school bus. Let's go let's go check it out, right? Well they don't realize that it's very dangerous. You drivers do. So you have to think for the kids, think for yourself, and oh by the way, watch for traffic around you, right? In the military we call it situational awareness. You have to have it at every single stop. You gotta know what's going on in front of you, behind you on each side. You just have to. Yes sir. Um, a training thing for everybody too, when I subbed the other night, I'm seeing way too many kids get off the bus that have to cross over. They walk out there and they think this big school bus is going to save their lives. They don't even look around the bus to see if there's a car coming. They don't look at the driver. We have to have them look at the driver to be waved across and you should be looking at all your mirrors to make sure there's nobody that's going to book through there. It, it's so yeah. scary. There's there's eighty percent of the kids just walk right around the bus and don't even look. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. training. That's that's bad for the bus driver. I don't blame the kids because the kids will get away with whatever they you let them. Every single day you have to wave those kids, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that yeah. later. But you have to wave the kids, not from the fog line. If those kids are standing anywhere on the shoulder or the fog line, you need to get them off the road, and I'll show you why. Um, you pull into here down the metro, I think this is, and this is saying if you stop right here in the front of your bus, if you're properly adjusted mirrors, you should be able to see all of these dots. So just visualize that as you're sitting in your bus. Can you see all those dots, or at least close to them? Remember, if you can't, then you have to adjust your mirrors properly, okay? Because then you're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is what we do before we move a bus. We scan the mirrors, check crossovers, close the door, perform mirror sweep again, and and I don't even like that term, mirror sweep. Do we really sweep our mirrors? No. Let's take a look at our mirrors and see what we're looking at. Check the door. Why do we check the door? Is the cold not hanging in there? Mm -hmm. When you're pulling away. Pulling away? Where do kids come back to when they look, when they left their hat on the bus? Mm -hmm. The door, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll come right in front of that bus. Um, also, they can get their coats or backpacks mm -hmm. caught in the door when it's shut. More than once in Minnesota, they hear this when they're taken off, and it's a kid being drugged down the road by the bus because his coat's caught in the door. 
So make sure you check that door. But if that happens, you fail the driver in multiple areas already, right? You fail to count your kids, and you fail to see the kids acting like coming back or whatever. Okay, so hopefully that doesn't happen, but we're asking you to do this. Um, it'll help prevent that. Four-way flashers, not less than 100 feet, right? Uh, bring the bus to a full stop. Not less than 15, nor more than 50 feet. Fully open your door, fully open your window, look both directions, listen, and make sure that your bus, the rear of your bus, can clear the last tracks by 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Pretty common sense, but it's just a reminder. Okay? If you find yourself down in the metro, and there's that new thing called the light rail down there, mm -hmm. and if this means anything to you, go ahead and memorize that. Um, otherwise, I'm from Boate, Minnesota, so I know what 5th Street and 1st Avenue means, but that's about it. But when you're here, okay, you're exempt from the school bus railroad crossing procedure. No stop is required. Simply pass through the intersection. So what that means is when, this is what you're going to see down there. These are exempt. You're going to see the black and yellow warning. You're going to see this sign. Bus and taxi exempt from stopping at tracks on green. You act as any other traffic. Why? Because that train, that light rail, is stopping for traffic. They are they are timed with the traffic lights. Okay, um, but only when you see that and you see the exemption. Mm -hmm. When you when you're in this area near Hiawatha and you see this, even with no train, we have to do the full up crossing procedures. Okay, so unless you see the exempt, just assume you're going to do the full up crossing procedures. Okay, this is a PSA that I'll let play. Because it brings up a couple of good points. I know I'm supposed to be paying attention, but I'm not. This text is hilarious. Besides, you know you're supposed to break the bus, right? Okay, same thing we just talked about, right? Did she get waved across? No. All right. Um, that's got to happen. You cannot let your kids cross that road without you waving them across. And you cannot wave the kids across until you know traffic is going to stop. Period. She has a set of earphones in. A great policy I've heard is no earphones on or off the bus. And I would, I would support that 100%. Yep. Absolutely. And if they're going to piss and moan, then let them piss and moan. That's the way I've had this morning. And the older kids are, are way too cool to look at the bus driver. Right. They're walking on the bus with the iPad, and he tripped on the first step. I said, give me that. You get it when you get to school. Yeah. He was a little bit sick, but I said, hey, you're not paying attention. Right. Exactly. Whatever these kids are doing, if they're not paying attention, take that distraction away from them. They don't have to pay attention when they're sitting on your bus. They have to pay attention when they're crossing roads. Because you're paying attention and you're going to honk the horn if something's coming, right? If your kids know what the honk means, if they've never been taught what a honk means, then they're going to do the same thing they're doing. It's just a honk. Okay, so teach your kids. So we got Highway 2, St. Louis County Driver. There's the yellow lights you can see on the thing. You'll see his red lights come on. There's dad and seven-year-old daughter. Watch. He stops, sees the truck coming, still activates his red. Look at that truck. Almost all the way on the shoulder. Yeah. We'll watch that again, but I want you to... We're actually going to talk about that real quick. So what did this driver do? And I'm, I'm a little harsh on this driver. But he's a nice guy. I talked to him because he was in one of my trainings a few months back. Um, this guy did everything in his power to kill that kid. No doubt, right? He comes to a stop. He's not paying attention. He's talking about being snubbed at the county fair by some woman. And he stops and he notices a truck coming at him. And what does he do? The worst thing he could possibly do, which is activate your red lights. What do kids do when the red lights come on and the bus yep. stops? They put their head down. And they walk across. Yeah. Okay. Now, this guy waves his kids across, so that kid knew not to move. 
that saved that child's life that day. Plus, dad was there. What you don't know about this story is that both dad and daughter are deaf. So a horn wouldn't have worked. When we asked the driver, why didn't you use your horn? Because they're both deaf. He knows his kids. He actually did well. What you don't see in that video is he's back there like this out the window. Right? So is that an option for us drivers? To, to know, let those kids know. Stay that you honk, you open that window, say stop, or put your hand out, you say wait mm -hmm. until we tell traffic clears, right? Now, the reason I tell you, don't let your kids hang out on the shoulders of the road. Watch this again. Watch for that truck driver passes the bus where his and entire vehicle is. See the amber? I said, hi, just stuck your nose in and walk the other direction. Look at where they're standing. No. Thank goodness. Here it comes. Look at that truck. Where is it? Yeah. There's no way he stopped. No way. Even if he tried. If that dude looked up and put his brakes on, now we've got a jackknife take out the whole bus with a tanker. That's even worse, right? So, the driver needs to pay attention. Stop talking about being snubbed at the county fair. Pay attention to what's going on around you. All right? Now, what's, what are our choices in, if that same thing is happening, right? Because this is pretty common. You pull up, you hit your ambers, you're, you're slowing down for a stop, and there's five or six cars or even two or three cars coming at you, and you're not sure that they're going to stop. What do you do? Wait to see what they do. Wait to put the... Yeah. You wait to put your strap arm off so right. you can see that traffic is going to stop. That happens a lot around here where cars come flying, like on Highway 61. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they might come to a screeching halt. Right. But the best is to not put the reds on until you can see that the traffic is observing and it's right. going to stop. So yeah, exactly. So we got cars coming at us, and maybe it's a newbie to that road. They don't know where your stop is at, but you do, right? So we can put it up, we can activate our lights, we can slow down way back here yep. and wait till traffic comes to a stop and then, then move up the final few feet and put the reds on, right? Or what if we're stopped and like this guy was stopped and he looks you like, oh boy, because there was a crest of a hill about three quarters of a mile back. He should have seen that way before, but he didn't, he wasn't paying attention. Uh, so the last thing you want to do is what he did, which is activate your reds. Yeah. That's when you keep your yellows on, you open your window, you honk, you yell, you put this out the door and you say, do not move, right? And you let traffic clear. Never mind about getting a plate and all that stuff. Worry about your kids' safety first, okay? And, and like I said, keep your kids off of the shoulder of the roads. They need to be well off. Because look where that guy was. If they were standing on the shoulder of the road, they'd be dead. Okay. Did that driver of the truck even see the people on the right side? I don't there? think he did. Wow. Because just like any other human, you get concentrating on the flashing lights, mm -hmm. right? That's why we like to rotate our lights at night because people they're, they're like flying. They they look and you drive where you're looking and you don't even realize it. That's why we have the new Ted Fox move over law because. Sometimes you'll see a cop stop at night and it's just the yellow arrow, right? Instead of just all the green and red or red and blue lights. Well, because studies have shown that people are more apt to obey a single source of stimuli, in other words, instead of everything at once, because they get fixated on the light and they go <coughs> right into the back of the squad. Anyhow, moving on. Eight way activation requirements, okay? The preamber activation under 35 miles an hour. We're looking at minimum of 100 feet, over 35, minimum of 300 feet. That's the letter of the law, right? So let's. Now this guy activates his amber late, but he's waiting for traffic to clear in front of his two cars. He stops right here. There's two more cars he's going to let pass, which is a good thing. He kind of makes a quick stop here. Let's these guys buy and then stop and activate this red right here. There's your honk, right? <laughs> Just a little bit late, right? No. Situational awareness, again, we talk about you got to look at your rears too. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
this guy, the, we finally tracked this guy down. Uh, by the end of the day, he turned himself in after we kind of got close to him. This is what he got from the judge. He went directly into custody. It can be reduced to that if he followed all of these. Um, judge was pissed off at this guy. You know what this guy told my lieutenant when my lieutenant went and interviewed him? He asked, is the little girl all right? Okay. This guy didn't even know if he hit the little girl or not. And he kept going. He, he never called in, nothing. We had to go find him. So the judge took a look at him for a gross misdemeanor. Uh, seven inches. His truck missed that girl by seven inches. And if you can see where she was standing, watch where she's standing. Again, how important it is that where these kids are standing in the morning. Look where she's standing right there. Quite a bit the ways back where we wanted her to, right? Seven inches. That's what that truck missed her by. Okay, pretty big deal, right? Let's talk about student management. We'll watch the second video here because it's the same same video, just different camera angle. Bus driver is a good bus driver, she felt horrible, but 
school. The yeah. translation guy just got to have a copy. Yeah. Because if something happens to you and I go in and talk to the school, I'm going to pull your file and that, that should be, that I better be in there. Okay. Remember, if you drive a school bus, you're subject to a random controlled substance testing, right? And part of the transportation director's job is to make sure that every school bus driver is on the eligible list to be drawn for the test. Um, if that isn't the case, that's kind of a big deal, and we look down on that as upwards to a thousand dollar fine per name. So kind of a big deal, right? So if you do be called to take a drug test, how to pass that without even studying is don't take expired prescription medication. Just don't take it. Don't take it if it's not yours. Don't take your wife's prescription meds. Um, and if you are under the influence, okay, don't drive. In other words, you've got one of these doctors and you've got heart issues, kidney issues, liver, whatever your case is, and the doctor says, well, let's flip this medication with this medication, let's add this one, and you're one of these people that takes 10 in the morning and 12 pills at night, um, and you're kind of rotating because your body's acting all weird, right? That's fine, as long as that, that person knows you have a CDL and you have a medical waiver for some of it. But what you need to understand is, if you're switching your meds or you're getting on new meds, new meds and you, you wake up in Barnum one morning and you end up in, in Pine City and you don't remember why or how you got there, it's kind of a big deal, right? So we need to call the bus director and be like, hey, I need to take a week off and let you rub my meds. So this is the stuff that's going to kind of tell you that, hey, maybe I shouldn't be out there driving my school bus when I can't, when I'm sleeping through my alarms, I'm driving and I can't remember stuff. 
I've been a guy who wakes up at 5 o'clock every single morning for the last 10 years, and all of a sudden I woke up one morning at 9 a.m., and I don't know what happened. But I just started a new medication. These are stuff that you need to put together if you're like, I need to get the fix, okay? Bus evacuations, are we going through them? Like there's going to be a real emergency, or are we just opening the back door for these kids and shuffling through? Okay, big kids, help the little kids out the back door and do it twice, and we're going to call that good, right? I hope you're not doing that. You guys remember this incident from Aiken County? It's an actual Ohio bus driver. Okay, what's going on with this guy? You guys remember? Medications? Is this the diabetic? Diabetic reaction. Is there anybody on the bus? Yes. Okay. Has about 11 kids on there, I believe, 7 to 11. And there's a couple older kids, too, that are now on the cell phone with 911. Is he passed out? No, he's fully awake. Seven having a diabetic wreck. What I've heard from nurses, when someone has a severe diabetic reaction like this, they're wide awake, but their brain's literally shut down. They don't even know what they're doing. They think they're doing all right, then. Yeah, <laughs> they don't know. A lot, of, a lot of medical issues that we deal with on the road. People call in as drunk drivers, obviously, right? Yep. You would think this guy is a hammer. Yep. He hasn't had a drink of alcohol. It's a medical issue. Um, so we end up getting in front of this guy and we're going to spike his tires and try to get him stopped. He's just simply not stopping. We've been behind him for 15, 20 minutes with lights and sirens and he won't stop. Okay. Is he making his stop? No. He, he's actually way off the road. Oh, okay. He's, he's in, he's an Iowa bus driver, but he's now in Aiken County. He has no idea if he's on planet Earth or Pluto right now. So we get his tires on the right side all spiked. That trooper missed the majority of them. So we got to send him back to rookie school. But. Do all of the squad cars have those spikes in them? Not all of them. Most all state troopers do. I don't know about other counties, but most of them do. How long does that take to flatten? Uh, it takes I don't I don't know the length. It depends on how many how many spikes. Well, this guy's getting out of the way. <laughs> Ooh, that's a smart yeah. driver. <laughs> yeah, but those those spikes are little tubes. They're little straws that are real sharp, and they go into the tire and slow the release of the air. So the tire doesn't blow up. Uh, I mean, typically we hit them for people that are going really fast, and you like, don't want the tires to blow. It'll flip the vehicle. Yeah. No. But his tires are now all flat. They're going flat on the right hand side there, and uh, he finally hits the ditch here, and we finally get him stuck. Well, he gets stuck. And you'll see that the last thing you'll see is his tires are still spinning. So he's trying to get out of the ditch. Look up, look at the height there in the ditch. So the officers don't go into the back door because he's still going. All they have to do is put a reverse back, back over him. Why did I show this video when I'm talking about bus evacuations? Not a single kid in that bus came up and opened the door, came up and shut the key off, came up and did anything. They just sat, they're scared, understandable. But you've got to train your kids. Hey, what if I'm the emergency? What if we crash and I get knocked out? What are you going to do? Are you going to, if that bus is stopped, you need to come up and shut that key off. You need to open that door and get those kids out, right? Not one kid did that. We busted all the glass off the side main door and bent metal to get in there to get that guy out behind the wheel because the kids just sat there frozen. So when we're teaching our kids bus evacuation, what I'm asking you to do is teach them 
how to get out of a bus in a real emergency. Not on a nice September day in a parking lot, okay? Make those kids go around with those, those windows. They're your emergency windows. Please don't go up and lift the handle or lift the handle till it just, okay, that's it, good, let's, let's move on. No, make the older kids especially that you know and trust go and actually open the full window. Make them do it. When a bus tips over, which they're likely to do if they're T-boned, they go into a ditch, right? What's the best way out of the bus? Through rough patches. Have you ever, have you ever taught your kids how to open that? You, you have to. Make your older kids, don't just say open that and try to climb out, right? Good luck. Most of them are like, what are you talking about? I don't even know, you, I don't know how to do it. Well, do you think in a real emergency when that bus is tipped over and it's on fire that they're going to realize how to do that? You've got to teach your kids how to evacuate a bus in an emergency, not on a nice day in a park. Okay? So get it done. Make sure they know how to open the door. Simple things like this. If that bus driver would have said, hey, you three or four older kids that are on my bus every day that I trust that actually have a brain in their head, this is how you open the door. If something ever happens to me where I get stuck or I, we're in a crash and I can't help myself or you, come open this door or open those roofs or open the back door. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to start doing this. This just happened in Bemidji again about two and a half weeks ago. Except if this was on a 10 scale, it was probably about a two or three scale. We got a trooper buddy of mine right behind him right away, but he was all over the road. We didn't hit the ditch, thank God, we got him stopped. But again, my trooper buddy, I got the video, pulls up behind him and is walking up there, knocks on the glass for the guy to stop. And the guy takes off again. You know, he's having a diabetic reaction. Um, so this is becoming more and more common, unfortunately. So teach our kids what to do in case an emergency and in case you are the emergency. So if you want to get yourself a citation, and I show up on your bus after a route and I see this, okay, kind of a big deal, right? Or we see this, duct tape, that, okay? You guys know what fight or flight means, so I'm not going to bore you, but I'll tell you, if you're in a flight situation, you'll bend that metal, that red metal handle before you'll figure out all you got to do is slide that up and then go like that, no. right? No. Okay. Gotta keep the IOS unobstructed. It's as easy as that. That's a, that's a ticket every time. We don't use cell phones when we're driving. We have to use it even for a business call. We pull over, get out of traffic, right? Use the phone and get back on. It's pretty common sense stuff, but it's a lot. Otherwise, you'll get caught like this metro driver did by a rascal little first grader with a cell phone, texting while he's driving around in the metro. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. not a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think he drives anymore, I'm not sure. Uh, texting while driving, same thing. Remember, the statute says, or send an electronic message, to compose, read, or send. But officer, I was just reading it. Uh -uh. But officer, I was stopped at a traffic light. I stopped at the red light. You're still part of traffic. Okay, it's still illegal. You know, I've, I made two trips to the cities for extracurriculars here in the last month or so. And when you drive down the freeway in a high vehicle, like you can see what's going on in the yeah. I saw more people texting while they're driving down the freeway. They get alongside of you <clears throat> and they'll slow down and then they'll speed up. Yeah. And they're sitting there texting. It's disgusting. It, it is. is. It's terrible. Yeah. And we think we're doing good because we got five or six extra vehicles out there. That's a bunch of BS. We're, uh, we've already had five or six vehicles. Um, we should be getting about 15 or 20. You know, there's no reason guys like me, I don't need a fully marked white door squad. I Give me a nice unmarked SUV with as much traveling as I do, and I can write those tickets all day and night. But they don't want to do that. So I don't, whatever, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just saying, it, it's a real problem. It's worse than the beef drunken. And the other thing that happens 
is, and it happened more than I've ever seen it before on those two trips, where if, if I'm driving down, I'm in the right lane, I'm driving speed limit, got the cruise control set, and you come up behind somebody that's driving a little slow, so you're going to pass them, and you look in the mirror and there's a car way back quite a ways, so you've got room to put your turn signal on, move over to the left lane, and all of a sudden the car that's way back there speeds up, comes roaring right up behind you. Yeah. What, you know, they've been hanging back there for a long time, but as soon as you put your turn signal on to move out, yeah. what, they don't what, want to get behind the bus. Or, I don't know what the problem What is. percentage of the accidents are caused by the texting? I don't know a, a specific percentage. The problem is the majority are not even registered as a texting and driving. Or, you know, the distracted driving, let's just say we blanket it all as distracted distracted driving, then it's very high. Mm -hmm. um, but but we get we we get called to the crash and unless that person admits being on the phone or it's obvious that they were on the phone, you know, we hardly even ask. Well we'll ask them, well what happened? Oh I just didn't see him or my this happened. I swerved for a deer, right? Or whatever the case is. Well BS, but you can't prove it, right? So you have to take the word for it. I mean if they hurt somebody in the crash or kill somebody, we're gonna do a subpoena on their records. But unless it's a serious crash, we don't bother with that stuff. So it's a lot higher than is reported, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. My guess is upwards of probably 70, 80 percent, mm -hmm. honestly. That's why we don't call them accidents in the patrol, we call them crashes because they're, they're cars, they're man made. Right? An accident is something that happens, you know, crash is caused by somebody, and usually it's someone not paying attention. Okay. When you guys go over and do your license in the next four years, you have to provide proof to the state that you're a citizen, period. Okay, just remember that. Next time you go in to get a renewal, bring in your a certified copy of your birth certificate, okay? Or if you, no. Yes. No. Or if you have a valid, unexpired U.S. passport, bring that in, okay? This is new as of July 1st of this year and goes oh. to June 30th of 2019. This is the federal government. This is C2C, Canada to Mexico, every CDL driver out there, not just Minnesota bus drivers. Every CDL, when they renew in the next four years, has to provide proof that they are citizens citizen of, of a state. So the next time you go in there, please do this. You know, otherwise you're gonna kick yourself, you're gonna wait in line to talk to the grumpy old ward faced uh, uh, I should say that person, grumpy old DMV, guy. DMV people, and then they're going to be like, I need proof of citizenship. And you're going to be like, damn it, that trooper told me and I forgot. Mm -hmm. You have to do it once in the next four years, not twice, just once. And you don't need a, a, a birth certificate and a passport, you just need one of the two. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you have a passport, you've already proven that you're a citizen, okay? Um, if you know a female bus driver who's not here, um, they should probably... They have to bring a birth certificate, but if their maiden name's on it, then they have to also bring a marriage certificate or a marriage and divorce certificate or, you know what I'm saying, whatever. Mm -hmm. They have to justify every legal name change. So, all right, that's what that just says, mostly to the females or the male. If you change your name, then you just got to prove your legal name changes. Uh, the bus rodeo, there's a little plug for one of our fun days down in the metro. It's kind of just a fun day that we do driving the bus and free trip, you know, it's, I haven't been to one, but I hear they're fun. Questions, concerns? Okay, remember this, all right? And if you didn't get anything out of it, 